Well, welcome everyone to this week's Mountain West ATC Echo. I am excited to be here, happy to see you all, and really, really excited that we finally have new prep guidelines. And Joanne, excited to hear your perspective on these guidelines. So I think without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Steckler, whom you all know, to give us this update. Thank you very much, Brian, and welcome to this very exciting review of the 2017 update of the PrEP Clinical Practice Guidelines that were released in March of 2018. So we are going to be talking to them. I'm going to try to make this as exciting as possible and bring up wherever I think there might be a little bit of controversy or some gaps still in our guidelines. We are going to send these around to you if people haven't seen them. It's really nice. Things are highlighted to indicate what is new for you. If you have our if you know the old guidelines really well, it's helpful to sort of point out these are really the only things that have changed. So one of the things that we're going to bring up is this grading of strength of recommendations and quality of evidence, which I'm sure you all bring up in various conversations before. But just to refresh your all memories, things get broken down into one, two, three, and ABC. Uh, based on the level of evidence and the strength of the evidence. One being a more than one well-executed randomized clinical trial, two being more than one well-executed non-randomized or observational cohort, and three being expert opinion, and A, B, and C being strong, moderate, or optional recommendations. I'm also giving you page numbers for you to follow along if you'd like. So this is the summary. So this is really what you need to know, which is these updates have a lot of new background. A lot happened between, I think the old ones were in 2014. Does that sound right? Um, lots of additional data from a few more randomized clinical trials, plus a lot of demonstration projects. And all of that information has been summarized for you. We are going to talk about some minor changes in who should be offered PrEP, at least in how the guidelines describe them. A fair amount of detail in terms of additional testing recommendations, mostly minor, but just more guidelines. A few things about what not to do, including TAF, which we've talked about several times over the last few years, as well as event-based dosing, and we can talk about that if you'd like. And then some very clear guidelines, surprisingly, about uh, how PEP and PREP work together. So who should be offered PREP? So I've given you the quote, PREP is recommended as one prevention option for sexually active men who have sex with men at substantial risk of HIV acquisition. And this is a 1A recommendation that's the strongest that we have. This is not a change from the prior. But I just wanted to um, have that in detail for you. Uh, what has changed in this is, again, what's highlighted in yellow is that just the indications for PREP use for men who have sex with men specify that the sexually transmitted infection that may have been diagnosed or reported in the past six months is specifically a bacterial STI, including syphilis and gonorrhea or chlamydia, acknowledging that someone may have had an infection with herpes or HPV or something that may not necessarily reflect their current risk for HIV acquisition. So I'm not going to go through what these recommendations are in detail, I ask you to look at them. They're very broad, which is going to be one of my comments in a few slides from now. Uh, any adult man who is not HIV infected, who has had any male sex partners in the last six months and not in a monogamous relationship with a recently tested man who is also HIV negative and having anal sex without condoms in the last six months or that bacterial STI. In terms of heterosexual men and women, again, PrEP recommended is one prevention option for adult heterosexually active men and women who are at substantial risk for HIV acquisition. Again, a 1A recommendation with the who is at risk indicated in that box below with the only change, again, being the specification that it is a bacterial STI, syphilis, and gonorrhea. Note the absence of chlamydia for heterosexuals, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then finally, this is uh, for people who inject drugs. Again, a 1A recommendation. I didn't have enough room to give you the actual statement, but believe me that it is a 1A recommendation again. And I want to point out two things on here. The first is that so that in the top box, B3, they previously included that someone who had been in a methadone bup or suboxone treatment program in the set past six months would be an indication for her PrEP. And they removed that in the current guidelines. And they said 
in the description that this was because it was confusing. I believe that this was there to indicate sort of commitment to reducing one's risk for HIV infection. Um, but the reason for the removal is just because of confusion by providers. The other thing I want to point out is just a semantics issue in, in these new guidelines that we used to call people who inject drugs injection drug users, and now the official terminology is people who inject drugs. Just like we are no longer saying unprotected sex, we are saying condomless sex to indicate that PrEP use provides protection. There is a move to change terminology to make this people-centered. I did a, tried to, a little search yesterday trying to find a explanation for this that wasn't just my explanation. And one explanation that I found came from uh, UN AIDS from their terminology guidelines in 2015. And I'll let you read the whole slide and just refer to the part on the right that says the preferred term. It is preferable to use person or people who inject drugs because of the place, because they place the emphasis on people. So we are trying to center people in our discussion. Who should, in terms of who should or should not be offered PrEP. So what I see as missing from these revised guidelines is although the guidelines are very broad in saying who could be offered PrEP, what I think it's missing is who should really be offered PrEP with greater assistance to us, both in clinicians and public health, in targeting individuals and populations who are at the greatest risk for HIV acquisition. There's no comment at all here about racial or geographic disparities and knowing that some of the risks for HIV that may be here locally in the Northwest, people who live in the South, African Americans, may not have the same what we would consider levels of risk that put them um, at greater risk for HIV infection. So simply being an African American in the South puts one at risk for HIV infection, which is very different than what we consider to be our highest risk populations here in Seattle and the Northwest. And then I think many of us were hoping for more guidance on serodiscordant relationships in which the HIV positive partner is stably suppressed. We There is a big push towards the U equals U, that someone who is undetectable, stably undetectable, cannot transmit HIV or has a super, super so risk so that it can't be quantified risk of HIV. And there is an acknowledgement in these guidelines with that, with a lot of qualifications saying, we don't really know about the stability of the person, there may be other partners, but there's no explicit statement saying that individuals who are monogamous in serodiscordant relationships should not be offered PrEP. So no guidance as to the negative. Um, the one thing they do say is around conception in discordant relationships, and PrEP should be discussed as one of several options to protect the uninfected partner during conception and pregnancy, so an informed decision can be made about benefits and risks. And this is a moderate with some uh, evidence, but not randomized clinical trials, of course. But it's sort of a absence of conversation about this topic, which I think is really something that is important from a public health standpoint. Moving forward into the testing guidelines, this is a newish figure in the guidelines, which I think are still relatively complex. And this figure is mostly intended to help guide uh, screening when there are signs and symptoms of acute HIV infection. So we all know that we have to do HIV testing uh, to ensure that someone is HIV negative. There has been evidence suggesting that individuals who are HIV positive uh, and recently infected have a greater risk of drug resistance if they start PrEP because Truvada being two medicines and not three, that's the real risk of drug resistance in individuals on PrEP. And so there's been a big push to do the best HIV tests as close as possible to PrEP start and to screen with signs and symptoms. The change does, again, highlighted in yellow here down in option one, is just saying that if you have someone who has symptoms that it is preferred to do a laboratory-based test for fourth generation testing over a HIV RNA viral load test, over a retest someone in one month. With Again, I think this is the push towards getting individuals with acute HIV infection diagnosed sooner and getting them on treatment sooner. There is more guidance about which HIV tests to use for screening. 
that's on this slide. So again, 1A recommendation that acute and chronic HIV infection must be excluded by symptom history and HIV testing immediately before we prescribe PrEP. What is not new is this recommendation to try to start PrEP one within one week after the last HIV test. I don't know how well people are able to adhere to this. Sometimes we have challenges getting people on insurance with all of their documentation needs or medication assistance paperwork, getting them to complete that within one week. So I have a one month absolute cutoff, but and obviously I try and start as close as possible. What is new in this is the comment that that initial screening should be ideally a lab-based fourth generation antigen antibody test or also new, something that we've talked about, when someone is off PrEP for at least one week, we've had a conversation about you know how many days does someone need to be off before you do retesting and this new CDC guidelines say it should be one week, they should have another HIV test or there are some places that prescribe, do same day PrEP prescribing off of a rapid HIV test, a point of care test, some of an antibody test, and in this case, the CDC recommends that blood be sent for a laboratory-based fourth generation test. There's a little bit more about hepatitis B and hepatitis C infection, including an explicit statement that hepatitis B infection is not a contraindication to PrEP use. I think we've had a conversation about this also in, in uh, prior conversations. There's a new recommendation that patients Patients found to be um, have active hepatitis B, being hepatitis B surface antigen positive, should be evaluated for possible treatment either by the clinician providing prep care or by linkage to an experienced hepatitis B care provider. They make the comment about uh, hepatitis C cohort treating, cohort testing. So um, hepatitis C testing is recommended for people who have ever injected drugs as well as for men of sex with men starting PrEP. This hasn't been in my practice. And then, of course, anyone born in the 1945 to 1965 years. Uh, and then they recommend annual hep C testing as part of PrEP, but it actually would do this not as part of PrEP for anyone who's actively injecting drugs. There is a new section on STI testing to explicitly state what this should involve as part of PrEP. There's a recommendation to screen for syphilis and gonorrhea at baseline and semi-annually. This shouldn't be a surprise. The chlamydia screening recommendations are different. So as I mentioned, for men of sex with men, the recommendation is to screen baseline and at least semi-annually. We'll talk about um, sort of more frequent testing in a second. But women frequent testing is not recommended for chlamydia as part of PrEP. Uh, it wasn't clear to me the rationale for this. They refer you to the 2015 uh, STD testing guidelines. They explicitly say what tests to include, specifying that we should be doing three site NAT for throat, rectum, and urine. Self-collected self specimens for men are okay. Self-collected vaginal swabs for women okay. And of course the reminder that women sometimes have anal sex and that we should be asking about that. Finally, there's what I was expecting in the change in this guideline was uh, increased frequency of STI testing for men sex with men. So again, there is recommendation for every three month, basically at every visit, do STI testing for anyone who is symptomatic of any category. And there's now a new recommendation to screen quarterly for asymptomatic men of sex with men, and they add these quotes, at high risk for recurrent bacterial sexually transmitted infections. And the example that they give is anyone with a past sexually transmitted infection or multiple sex partners. And I just want to refresh you to the rationale for this, which um, was a presentation by Stephanie Cohen from San Francisco at Croy from a few years ago. I looked to see if this had been published and I couldn't find it, but it could, certainly could have been. But just looking at the proportion of STIs that would have been delayed until the six-month visit if we only did symptomatic testing among symptomatic men of sex with men. And if you look at the on the far right, basically the total number of STDs that would have been delayed if we were not doing screening of asymptomatic men of sex with men, and the answer is it's about a third. So thus the new recommendation for quarterly screening for any men who are high risk. So anyone with a past STI, anyone with multiple partners, however you would like to define that. Uh, a little bit more controversy in my perspective, so what not to use. The statements are new statements that tenofovir alone may be considered, and that's tenofovir dizoproxyl fumarate, of course. 
uh, may be considered as an alternative in people who inject drugs and heterosexually active adults, but not men who have sex with men. And that's entirely just due to the randomized clinical drug that the fact that there were two randomized clinical trials that included tenofovir among people who inject drugs and heterosexuals, but there have been no studies in men with men, 1C. The new specification of not using TAF, do not use other antiretroviral medications such as 3TC or TAF added to this. The 3TC was previously included in the statement, either in place of or in addition to Truvada or TDF tenofovir, 3A. And then finally, the prescription of oral prep for coitally timed or other non-continuous daily use, i.e. the Ipergay model, is not recommended with a strong expert opinion against this use. So we can talk about that if you have questions. Finally, uh, in terms of PEP, these are direct quotes. They have explicitly stated a gap is unnecessary between ending non-occupational PEP and beginning PrEP. There are some of us who had sort of toyed with the idea of whether we should wait until there was a final HIV test before starting PrEP, but of course people who are needing PrEP are at high risk and better to start PrEP sooner. And then guidance about what to do if someone on PrEP is exposed to someone with HIV. Of course, this is what PrEP is for. And so now an explicit explicit statement saying that patients who are fully adhering to a daily PrEP regimen, that may, you may have questions about that part of the statement, but that they do not need NPEP, they don't need that third drug if they experience a potential HIV exposure while being adherent to their two drug PrEP. So I think that's the end of my presentation.